um, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 11. And then Mark chapter 11, you're going to pick up in verse 27. And um, the title of this is really a question of authority. But this is a record of the events of the last week of Jesus' ministry before going to the cross. And so I'm just going to read Mark um, chapter 11, beginning in verse 27 and, um, through 33. But uh, it says, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority, authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe in him? For if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And so I just want to open in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight that all authority has been placed into your hands. Jesus is Lord of all. So we acknowledge your authority in our lives tonight. We do pray that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, you, would, um, you know the needs that are represented here among your people we pray that your Holy Spirit guides and opens the scriptures to us that we might understand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in this section, you know, Mark, uh, we've now entered into the last week and the final week of Jesus' life and his ministry before his death on the cross. And for the first time, you know, in Mark 11, Jesus has allowed the multitude of believers to declare him as um, their, their Messiah. He's allowed them to proclaim him as the Messiah. The Bible tells us that when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, um, he was riding um, a colt of a donkey. And of course, through that, he was fulfilling a prophecy of Zechariah from 500 years before. And as Jesus sat on the colt and the disciples, they led him down the road and then up into Jerusalem, um, toward the temple, it says that the people had taken palm branches and that they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the word Hosanna, of course, you know, it means save now, save us now. And they were saying, basically, they were saying, save us right now from the Romans, save us from their oppression. And we're told that when Jesus was riding upon the colt, that he actually wept over the city. He wept over the people because they didn't know or recognize the day of their visitation. And then note that at the beginning of the week, that, you know, they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then by the end of the week, they're saying, crucify him. We will not have this man reign over us. And so Jesus, he wept over the people because they didn't know the day of their visitation. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know his mission. Um, they weren't keeping up with the prophecies of the Old Testament of the coming Messiah. They should have recognized it, but they didn't, and so Jesus wept. And the Bible tells us that right after Jesus had made this triumphal entry, that he went into the temple area, and for the second time in his ministry, he began to overturn the tables of the money changers. And the religious leaders at that point could hardly contain their hatred. Um, and they were ready to put Jesus to death. However, the Bible says that they feared the people, and so they decided to approach Jesus in a different way, and that is they hoped to reduce or to minimize or discredit him in front of the people by asking controversial and divisive questions that could, and they hoped would sway the opinions of the crowds against Jesus. And this was a direct attack by the Jewish elite, setting the stage for a winner-take-all uh, showdown. Whoever wins um, will be seen as an honorable 
will be seen as honorable and uh, the rightful interpreter of the law. Whoever loses um, will have a lessened status before the community and will, will, will lose their authority to interpret the law. And so the first question, of course, had to do with authority. And so they said to Jesus, as we you know, read a moment ago, who gave you the authority to come in here and overturn these tables of the money changers? Who do you think you are? And who said that you could do this? And so this was an important question. You know, if Jesus said, you know, God told me to do it, then they would accuse him of blasphemy. If he said, I told myself to do it, then they would accuse him really of insanity. So what's he going to say? Well, Jesus, he gives an amazing reply to the question of authority. He responded to their question with a question. And Jesus, he was an expert at this. So the answer that they would give to his question would in turn give them the answer to their own question. So Jesus, he went back to the ministry of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, of course, you know, he was a herald. He was a uh, forerunner of Jesus, of the Messiah. He was the one who was proclaiming the Messiah and pointing to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he had a powerful ministry. People recognized him as a prophet. They came from everywhere out of Jerusalem, out of the Judean wilderness, really, to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. And John also had some bad dealings with the Pharisees. And, you know, he called them a brood of vipers, asked them, you know, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And so they had some history there. And so Jesus asked the question, listen, what do you think about John? Was his ministry from heaven or was it from men? Answer me that question. Now, Jesus had the religious leaders in kind of a catch-22 because everyone believed that John's ministry was authentic. It was powerful, and they believed that it was from heaven. So if they said John's ministry was from heaven, then they anticipated that Jesus would respond, then why didn't you believe in John? Remember, John's whole ministry pointed to the person of Jesus. So they thought, well, we can't say that. But if we say that John's ministry wasn't from heaven, then they anticipated that the people would turn on them because they all believed that John truly was a prophet sent from God. Uh, so they can't answer that. So they came back to Jesus. We've discussed it, and uh, we've decided that we don't know the answer to that question. Then Jesus responded, neither will I answer you, your question. So that was the end of that discussion right there. Because if John really was a prophet from God, then he was right about Jesus. And Jesus was indeed the Messiah. If John, uh, what he said was true, then Jesus had all the authority to do what he did. And it's interesting to me that I was reading this that Jesus didn't give them an answer. You know, I found some people through the years, it's best not to respond to them. You know, you don't really want an answer. You want an argument. You're trying to get me into something, and I'm not doing it. So, you know, I found that, that you should pick your battles wisely. Some people don't need answers. You know, what they need to do is be blocked, if you would. So the Pharisees, they were being confrontational. So Jesus, he now launched into a parable. And if you've been studying the ministry of Jesus, you know that a parable was essentially an illustration, a story that every listener could identify with. And it would grab the attention. And there was some spiritual truth attached to the parable, you know, if you were willing to search it out. So Jesus, he started out with this parable in Mark chapter 12 and verse 1, but it says, Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at 
Him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away, shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and they killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyards to others. Have you not even read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him but feared the multitude, for they knew, knew he had spoken the parable against him, them. So they left him and went away. Now, you have to remember, you know, Jesus, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. They were aware that the vineyard used in the Old Testament, it was used as a picture of Israel. Therefore, the vine dressers represented the rulers of Israel, and the vineyard rep- represented the people Um, of God as a whole. But when they understood that Jesus represented the owner of the vineyard's son, they wanted to put him to death. Again, Jesus revealing what was going on in their hearts. They wanted to kill him. And as you know, the story became a reality and they would actually crucify Jesus, you know, God's precious son, just within the next couple of days. Now, several revelations I think you can get from this, but um, one, I want you to notice and to observe, do you see the patience of God that he would continue to send his uh, servant after servant and even his own son to reach the people? You know, he could have said, you know what? I've sent enough people. I've sent enough servants. I've sent um, enough um, They've all come back beaten up. They've come back, they've been killed. I'm done sending servants to you. I'm going to send judgment on you instead. But he was patient. Um, He was long-suffering. He kept sending people, trying to get the message out. You know, sometimes people don't want to hear the message, no matter uh, who comes, no matter who delivers the message. They just uh, harden their hearts to it. You also see not only the patience of God, but the foolishness of man to reject the messengers that God had sent. And you see the father's love uh, when he was willing to send his most prized possession of all, his precious son. And then it also reveals that there is judgment coming on those who reject the Messiah. And so another Pharisee, hearing the story, the parable, they put two and two together and they realized he's talking about us. And that bothered them uh, greatly. They were the villains in the story. And so Jesus then quotes from Psalm 118. We sang about that tonight, but um, Psalm 118, which prophetically describes what would happen to the Messiah, that he would be the stone, the cornerstone on which the foundation was to be built on. But the Pharisees would reject that stone. They would uh, throw out that that stone. They would reject it, and um, they would actually stumble over the rock, the stone, the rock, which is Jesus Christ. But regardless of their stumbling over him and casting him out, he would become the chief cornerstone, you know, that everything was going to be built upon. You know, remember in the book of Acts in chapter 4, um, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, you know, he quoted from this exact scripture. You recall Acts chapter uh, 4, uh, verse 8, but then it says, then, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. 
And then verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And Peter also quoted the same particular scripture after the healing of the lame man on his way uh, to the temple to pray. And Jesus, you know, he's often likened into a stone or a rock in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, you know, he's the rock of provision that followed Israel in the desert. In 1 Peter 2, 8, he's the stone of stumbling. And then Daniel 2, 45, he's the stone that was cut without hands that crushes the kingdoms of the world. And so they knew he had spoken a parable against them. them. They were cut to the heart. They were convicted, really, by the Holy Spirit. And they reacted to the conviction of the Holy Spirit by rejecting, not receiving. And they plotted to murder Jesus instead of repenting uh, before him. And if you can imagine that, the Holy Spirit ministering to you, but you want to kill somebody. And it's an odd thought. And so Jesus became the chief cornerstone what everything's built on. And so, you know, I want to encourage you tonight to build your life on Christ. If you're looking for a solid foundation to build your life, to build your marriage, your family, raise your children, the most solid foundation there is, it is Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. You know, the church is built on the foundation of Christ. Everything else, it's shifting sand. Everything else is going to crumble. It's going to fall. But if you build your life on Christ, no matter what happens, you will be able to stand. And I encourage you just to do that if you haven't. And so the first attempt to trap Jesus, you know, was on the issue of authority. That failed, it backfired. So they decided to regroup with even more polarizing issues, more controversial things even than um, that they might catch Jesus in it. The first thing, you know, of course, it had to do with civil authority. And now they come at him. The second thing is with taxes. And that's a worse, uh, subject worth considering. Verse 13 it says, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Now, wow, you know, that's a tough one. <laughs> they used, they invoked the name of Caesar. Wow. Every Jew, you know, they were subject to pay taxes. They hated it, probably like you do. I certainly do. They despised the tax. There was even a poll tax. A poll tax is a tax so that you can live, you know, we, we're going to tax you just, just because you're alive. Uh, so, um, you know, it was just taxes here, taxes there, much like us, <laughs> if you will. But um, they hated the taxation of Rome. This was controversial, something that the people were going to get fired up about. And so they asked Jesus, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay uh, Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Now, if Jesus said in response... It's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. Then they could have run to the governor and, and they would have said, you know, he's in violation. He's inciting, provoking people to stop paying taxes. He's an insurrectionist. We need to imprison him or uh, put him to death. On the other hand, if he said, yes, it is lawful, the people who were e so eager to follow him, they would be disillusioned and leave him. And so they thought, you know, we've got him. Um, they said, he's not getting out of this one. There's no way he's getting out of this. We've got him. They seem to have put Jesus into a trap. You know, if he agreed the tax should be paid, then he would appear to deny the sovereignty of God over Israel. And then he would lose popular support. You know, if Jesus agreed that the tax should be, not be paid, then he would be openly declaring himself to be an enemy of Rome and would be treated as a revolutionary. So you could almost see the smug, uh, self-satisfied smiles of the Pharisees and the Herodians as they skillfully threw this question on Jesus. You know, they thought that he was in a trap um, that he couldn't get out of. But 
you know, the truth is you can't put Jesus in a trap. Now look at Jesus' response. You know, it's so perfect the way he responds to these leaders, really these haters, but um, he, knowing their hypocrisy, he knew that this was a scam. He knew it was a setup. He said, why do you test me? Why do you test me? You know, we should never say that Jesus taunted his adversaries, you know, in an ungodly way. But he did um, let them know that they were never going to win against him. And of course, you know, they didn't answer. But he said to them, you know, bring me a denarius that I may see it. And so they brought it. And it's interesting, you know, again, that, you know, Jesus, he didn't have any money on him. He didn't have money. There wasn't any of this you know, health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine going around that, you know, he's just like pockets full of money or whatever. But to Jesus, you know, he asked, anybody got a coin? Let me borrow a coin. Um, so he didn't want to have one until somebody gave him a denarius. And then he said, whose image is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said to that, well, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they all marveled. And what a reply. You know, whose image is this? Well, it's Caesar's image. Well, then give it to Caesar. And so, likewise, you know, who here is created in the image of God? We all are. So, give to Caesar what belongs to him. And give yourself to God. Surrender to God. You know, what a powerful word that was. There was nothing in it that Jesus could be um, incriminated with. In addition, he reminded them of their obligation to God as well. And in, in Jesus' answer, it tells us that in that, that Caesar doesn't have all authority. There are some things that should be rendered to God alone. When the state asks something of us that belongs to God alone, you know, we're duty bound to obey God before the state. So, you know, Caesar is somewhat powerful, but all power does belong to God. And so, there was no further question about, you know, civil authority or taxes at that point. He had answered them, but you would think that they'd maybe had enough, that they wouldn't want to ask Jesus any more questions. But they weren't done. Um, they still had more questions. They had questioned him on authority. They questioned him on taxes. Now they're going to question him on theology. You know, you have the Sadducees. You have the Pharisees. You have the Herodians. And by the, you know, the way the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, these people didn't necessarily like each other. You know, they didn't spend much time together. They were opposed to one another, but they were united in the purpose of taking Jesus down. You know, it's interesting how people can be enemies until they find a common cause to fight against. And that's what happened here. You know, these former enemies became friends, you know, in, in taking, trying to get Jesus to be taken down. And so they send another group called the Sadducees. And it says in verse 18, then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if, man, if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took his wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died. Nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. So they thought they had Jesus. He can't answer this one. You know, there's no way he can't answer this one. Now, the Sadducees, they were the counterpart to the Pharisees. The Sadducees were a part of the governing body of the people. You know, you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They disagreed on several things. And one of the things that they disagreed on was the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible, um, the books of Moses. 
And it said, you know, the Sadducees, they were well-educated, sophisticated, they were influential, wealthy, aristocratic, worldly-minded, ready to cooperate with Rome, uh, which of course enabled them, them to maintain their you know, privileged position that they were in. Um, but they did not believe in the immortality, um, in spirits or angels. And so the purpose of their question was to make the idea of the resurrection really seem absurd. And so they came to Jesus asking him a question. And no doubt, you know, they had used this argument on many people before. It was well-worn, you know, they had, they had this one down pat. This one works every time. They thought no one has been able to answer this. So they present this hypothetical situation about a woman who ends up uh, marrying a guy, and then as you know, he dies, and then the other, bri uh, brothers, the other brothers die accordingly seven times. And this is really important, you know, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 25, there's this miscellaneous law that Moses put in place for the nation of Israel. And it was really put in place to keep the tribes together and that was that if a man died, then his brother was to raise up a name for his family by taking his, brother, um, his brother's wife as his own. And you see examples of that in the Old Testament several times. The book of Ruth is really about that. But there was a way to get out of that if you didn't want. And it's kind of interesting, but I thought I'd mention that. But there's a way to avoid having to follow through of this because um, it's in the Bible. <laughs> but I want to share it with you. Share it. If you didn't want to raise up a name for her, there was a way to get out of this. Um, in Deuteronomy 25, verse 7, it says, But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name for his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house, and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal removed. Spit in his face, take his shoe. No, yes. <laughs> That's how it would go down if you didn't want to raise up um, a name for your dead brother, <laughs> if you would. But here in Mark 12, the hypo this hypothetical case, it's presented. It's not real. You know, it's theoretical. But Jesus answers, and, you know, this is so good. If you look at his response, you know, in verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So Jesus, he answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not uh, know the scriptures nor the power of God? And this is a serious criticism to these guys. You know, two things. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And that's your problem. You don't know God's word you're not really walking in or experiencing his power and that's a pretty bold thing for jesus to say to these guys i mean they're religious leaders if you would for some people today you know that's even their problem they don't know what the word of god says so you know they don't walk in the power of the scriptures or in the power of the holy spirit you know they never take time to read um, the bible they come up with all kinds of hypothetical you know the questions, you know, what about this? What about that? You know, is that really in the Bible? You know, did you come up with that on your own? You know, you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God and what a difference it is when you know the scriptures and you walk in the power of God. They didn't know. And so Jesus, he went on to say, 
with some insight into eternity for us, but he said, when they arise from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So that's interesting to make note of that when they arise from the dead, and note, first of all, they do rise, and then you're not going to be married in heaven. He's basically telling us that in heaven, our relationships there, you know, are different. And as wonderful as marriage might be here on this earth, it doesn't compare with our relationship with Jesus Christ and what it's going to be in heaven. There's something more wonderful than a godly, healthy marriage um, in God's presence that can't be compared with here on earth. You're not going to be bummed out in heaven, I guarantee you. You're going to be blessed. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> so, And so he's reminding of the, them of this. In heaven, you're not like in the sense, it's not like they're in the sense that they're angels. We're not, if we, when we die, we're not going to become angels. And don't misunderstand, you know, basically they are like the angels in the sense that they're not married and are not given in marriage in heaven. So that's something about eternity that we find out, you know, from Jesus here um, in this section. But then he says concerning the dead in verse 26. But concerning the dead, that they arise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. And this is really powerful. You know, remember the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And they said, there is no resurrection. So what does Jesus do? You know, he takes them back to the book of Exodus, you know, to the burning bush passage. Uh, when Moses was there on the mountain and, you know, he saw the burning bush and the Lord spoke out uh, to him from the bush. And he said, notice that he said this. He said, I am the God of Isaac Abraham and of Jacob, not in the past tense, meaning, you know, they're still alive. They're not dead. I'm currently, right now, currently the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. Not, I was, may they rest in peace. No, they are alive. In other words, so it just shows their folly and their misunderstanding of the scripture and therefore Jesus said that they were greatly mistaken and so you know he shuts down the Pharisees he shuts down the Sadducees um, but this wasn't the end so they came back yet another time and they sent another question and this time they sent one of the scribes and the scribes you know they were the experts in the law and so um, he comes and he asks what appears to be an honest question and he's asked, you know, which is the first commandment of all? And with this question, they tested Jesus to see if he would show disregard or neglect for some area of the law of Moses. So in verse 28, it says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all of the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, is this. You sh shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he and to love him with all the heart and with all the, the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely he said to him you are not far from the kingdom of God but after that no one dared ask him a question and Jesus at this moment when asked the question about the commandment, he sums up the law in two commandments. 
The first tablet of the law, you know, deals with man's relationship with God. You could sum it up by saying, love God. The second tablet deals with our relationship to our fellow man. And you could sum that up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. You could sum up the whole Ten Commandments um, in just the single word, love. Now, can you imagine, and have you ever thought about it, what it would be like if we just did these two things? You know, if I was perfect at just doing these two things, if you were perfect, I mean, if the world was just doing these two things, you know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. If we did that faultlessly, what a different world we would live in. I've thought about that, but, you know, um, two simple, but apparently not that simple commandments um, to love God and to love other people. But it would be awesome if people actually did those two things. Jesus told his disciples in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus said in verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Paul, in writing to the Galatians in chapter 5, 20, verse 22, concerning the fruit of the Spirit, said that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And this is love, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. And how important it is for us to learn to love. And I think, you know, the order in which Jesus places these two commands is significant. It's significant. Because when you understand God's love, then you're able to love others. You know, if I'm in a loving relationship with the Lord, then that enables me to love others in return. Really, the upward relationship that I'm in, love with him, with the Lord, enables me on the horizontal level to love other people. So when there's a problem with me uh, loving other people, sometimes it can be an indication that something's not right with my own relationship with the Lord. You know, maybe you have a relationship issue right now with someone giving you a difficult time. We all know that some people are easier to love than others. You know, Jesus said in Matthew you know, chapter 5, verse 46, he said, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And Jesus would go on to tell us, you know, to love those who aren't easy to love and to love them as we love ourselves. And just think, if we treated people the way that we wanted to be treated, if we loved people the way that we desire to be loved, there would be a lot less division in the world, a lot less fighting, a lot less hate in the world. So again, Verse 32, it says, So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, verse 34, when Jesus saw that he he, and then speaking of the scribe, he, the scribe, answered wisely. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared ask him a question. You know, the scribe, he had not fully put together the fact that uh, Jesus was the Messiah. Um, but gets it, you know, that the sacrifices and the offerings um, you know, they were of limited value. Um, he's starting to get this kingdom mindset, if you will. He's not far from the kingdom. Jesus knows he's right at the doorstep just by his response and by his, and Jesus can read, you know, what's going on with this guy. But um, he wasn't far from the kingdom. Perhaps he became a Christian at one point. We don't know, but um, Jesus saw it in him that he was very close. So the scribe realized that this was a profound and deep answer. He realized that it was the right answer. And he agreed with everything that Jesus said. In fact, he said, Lord, what you described in loving uh, God, in loving people, is more than all the sacrifices that one could offer. It goes beyond that. It's way beyond that. 
And I think that's exactly what the Apostle Paul meant in writing 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he said that you, know, you can offer sacrifices, you can um, offer your body to be burned, you can speak with the tongues of men, the tongues of angels, but if you have not love, it profits you nothing. So how are we loving God and others in this world where it's difficult to love? Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom. And now um, after that, no one dared ask him a question. Um, he pretty much shut everyone down. Every question, everything that everyone was concerned about or tr tried to entrap him with, you know, but I want you to keep something in mind here. And I think it's interesting. You know, this is taking place during the Passover season, right? You know, just a couple of days, he's going to be on the cross and um, paying for our sins. So it's the Passover season. This is the Passover celebration. Now, when a lamb was brought to be sacrificed, before it could be killed, it had to be examined to see if there was any blemish, to see if there was any problem, to see if there was anything that made it unacceptable or invalid for an offering. It had to be examined by the priest. They would look for whether there was some kind of a sore, something that made, um, made it so that you couldn't use it. You know, it went through an examination. And that's what we're seeing right here, is an examination of the Lamb of God. And he stands up to every exam, examination, every question, everything that they can bring at him. He's without blame. He's without fault. He's spotless. He's perfect. He is the sacrifice. And it was only a matter of time before he would be offered up. The perfect sacrifice. The perfect lamb. But then Jesus asked them a question. And in, unlike all the questions of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you know, their questions to Jesus where they tried to trap Jesus, Jesus did not do the same with his questions to them. Instead, he got to the heart of the matter. Do you know who I am? You know, these religious leaders, you know, they thought that they knew everything that there was to know about the Messiah. Jesus challenged this thought, and he asked them to consider um, that they may have something to learn. And it says there here in verse 35, it says, Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, um, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Now, that's a tough question. How do you answer that? The only way that he could be his son is if he is also God. And that's why he's going back to the Old Testament. We know that the Messiah had to be the son of Abraham. He had to be the son of David. But a father would never refer to his offspring as Lord. He just didn't do that. It wasn't what happened. They would always point back to the father. He's the son of David. Um, he's the son of Abraham. Um, but David never called any of his sons Lord. And um, Jesus, he asked this deep theological question. How is that possible? Why is David calling him Lord, his son? You know, Jesus is not only the son of David, but he's also the Lord of David. The book of Revelation 22:16 says, he is both the root and the offspring of David. So with this question, Jesus, he challenged the religious leaders, asking them, do you understand this truth about the Messiah? Now, I'm sure that everybody was surprised, probably blown away by what Jesus had just said. It says the common man heard him gladly. Then it tells us in verse 38, then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace and ba the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And so, 
you know, here, Jesus, he gives a warning. Hey, listen, all these people, these guys, um, beware of these guys. Watch out for them. They have an agenda. They're trying to take advantage of the people. And it's all about appearance. It's all about show. It's all for show. You know, in Matthew 23, Jesus, he pronounces a series of woes on the religious leaders. And it's powerful. And it's um, indicting. But here he gives a warning. Hey, watch out for these guys. They're taking advantage of the people. You know, it says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 11 that they will receive greater condemnation. And Jesus in Matthew, uh, Mark 6, he presented the idea of greater condemnation, that some will receive a worse judgment and a worse condemnation than others um, in eternity. And then finally, in verse uh, 41, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who, who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. And so now... Jesus sat next to the treasury and he notices how the people are putting money into the treasury. That many who are rich put in much, but then this one poor widow. And it's interesting that Jesus was sitting there. And I want you to notice something, but he was watching how people gave. Not so much the amount that they gave, but the way in which they gave. He looked at the motive of the heart and Jesus saw more than most could see in that. And it was normal and customary for those who would bring in a large amount to do so with a lot of fanfare. You know, maybe a, ba a brass band accompanying them or to come in before them playing loud music and they go in before and um, bring your offering in a wheelbarrow. You know, it's like, hey, what's going on? Hey, it's an offering to God. <laughs> Uh, this is the God, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, ka-ching, bling, 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 you know, it was a show, number one offering today. But, you know, Jesus, he watched it. Then it says that there was a widow that put in two mites, the equivalent of less than a penny. And I mean, it's nothing in comparison to what other people were putting in. And um, she could have kept one of the two, you know, and nobody would have known, you know. But for her, it was a sacrifice. It was everything she had. And Jesus pointed out to his disciples who may have been so impressed, you know, by what they'd seen and what had been given by others. Wow, you know, these people are given a lot. And it's really impressive. But he said, this lady right here gave more than everybody else gave because it cost her something. It was a sacrifice. She gave everything she had. You know, sometimes, you know, people wonder and ask, you know, what about the tithe? Wasn't that an Old Testament principle? That was under the law. But what do we give under grace? And my answer to that, Pastor Michael's answer to that is, I don't know. We don't know. That's for you to decide, for you and Jesus. You know, 10% for some people may be nothing. To somebody else, it may be a lot. You know, what we give under grace is as you purpose in your heart to give uh, to God, whatever God puts on your heart. I do believe scripturally, you know, that when we do regularly invest in the kingdom of God, that the returns, you know, they're going to be seen in eternity, sometimes even before um, eternity. We see some of the returns of the investment, you know, because, you know, you've given, because we give collectively as a church, you know, myself included, I'm happy to do it because, you know, I, I've recognized that it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. And everything that we possess is on loan. And the fact is that we can't take it with us when we go. We're going to leave it all behind. But you can send some of it ahead. You can lay, the Bible tells us that you can lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. And so if you want to invest in the kingdom of God, then do it as unto the Lord, not unto men. Nobody's going to be checking up on you, you know, whatever. That's between you and Jesus. But it's up to you. 
Giving should be a blessing. It should not be a burden. It should be a blessing. It should be done as unto the Lord, and it should be done because of your love for him. He doesn't want to take anything from you. Um, he's given us everything, and I'm really amazed, really, and I promise with this, but I'm amazed at what he lets us keep because it's really all his, and, and he could keep it all. Amen. So let's pray together. We'll close at this point here. But Father, we uh, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you that you do all things well. Thank you for your provision. Lord, for us as a church, God, as we pray to you, uh, we ask you to continue to use this fellowship in the days ahead. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow will bring but we do want to lift up this ministry to you. We lift up your word. We thank you for this church and this body of believers. Lord, we love you, and we pray that you just continue to send your Holy Spirit and minister to each and every one of us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.